Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to our vegetable garden here in Spokane, Washington. Our hardiness zone ranges from 5B to about 6A. Now I am very excited about today's topics which are soil and composting basics. Now I don't know if the weather is going to cooperate because we keep getting little downpours and you can see we've had some snow recently. Most of that has melted. And so it might seem really early to be talking about soil and composting, but my goal has been to give you all of this important basic knowledge, hopefully early enough before your garden season really gets underway and save you some grief. So let's get started. I think sometimes we take our soil for granted. It's just there, we plant things in it and hope that the plants will do great. But we don't stop to think about what's going on in this mass of soil. And it's something that is very important to take into consideration. So first of all, let me give you a statistic that you may already have heard, but I really want to blow your minds with this. So did you know that in one teaspoonful of soil, there are more beneficial microorganisms working away down there than there are people on the planet Earth. I think that is amazing. So I'm talking about different types of things like beneficial bacteria, fungi, protozoans. We all know we have earthworms in there. There are little creatures called springtails. There's all these different things and they're functioning at different levels within the soil. So the first thing I want you to remember is to respect your soil because without all of those microbes, we would not have gardens. First and foremost, do not work with wet soil. I know all of us are just itching to get out in the garden and to start working with the soil and planting things. But if your soil is too wet, very bad things will happen. Ask me how I know this. So many years ago, I thought, boy, I'm really going to get a jump on the season. And so I started working with the soil, even though it was quite wet. And I thought, wow, I've got the garden all ready to go. Now I just have to wait for the weather to warm up to plant things. The problem is when you work with soil that is super wet, it will clump together and form dirt clods. And instead of having this lovely, fine texture of soil, you're going to have awful soil for the entire season. So here's what you want to do. First of all, grab a handful of soil and squeeze it together. If you just created a mud pie, that means the soil is way too wet. But on the other hand, if it didn't get all mucky, and you open up your hand and you poke it apart with your finger and it just crumbles apart nicely, that's the time to start working with your soil. Now, once you've determined that the soil is dry enough and you're wanting to prepare the garden so that you can get some plants in, there's something really important I want you to keep in mind. Now, you recall I mentioned about all of those wonderful microorganisms that are in the soil. Well, they operate and function at different levels within the soil and they've created a very intricate type of a soil structure in there. We want to preserve as much of that as possible and so that means minimal disturbance of the soil. Now in the old days we were all taught that you use a rototiller or a shovel and you just turn over that soil like crazy. Of course, back then we didn't realize what we were doing to all of those wonderful microorganisms. We don't want to do that anymore. So I wanted to show you what I do. Now, of course, our soil is frozen solid. <laughs> so I can't exactly demonstrate this to you, but I can describe it. So I've got props. Let's say you want to transplant some seedlings that are in four inch pots. All you need to do is use a trowel and only make a hole where you need the plant to go, plant it from the soil around it, make a hole for the next one and so on. So just do it that way. If you need a trench for planting seeds, you can take a hoe and either use the handle end or the blade end and just drag it along the soil to make your little trench, plant your seeds and fill it back in. 
Now, one thing you can do, and I do this a lot, is you can use something like a spading fork. And what I do is I will push it down into the soil a couple of inches and wiggle it a little bit, take it out, move it a few inches over, do the same thing. And I especially do this when I want to incorporate some bone meal into the soil. So that is minimal disturbance, but it does help the bone meal move within the soil. Now, when I'm putting compost on the soil surface, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, I just leave it on the top of the beds because I know that the nutrients within it are going to filter down into the soil. So think of things you can do to have minimal disturbance of the soil. Keep your little microorganisms happy. Now I mentioned this in my fertilizer video last week, but I want to reiterate how important it is to avoid the use of synthetic non-organic fertilizers and instead use organic fertilizers and soil amendments. The reason behind this is that the synthetic fertilizers contain way more nutrients than the plants can use. And what happens is it's just basically waste in the soil. And if there's too much of it, that can kill those little microorganisms in the soil that are doing so many good things for you. So keep that in mind. Did you know that legumes like beans and peas fix nitrogen in the soil? So if you've grown peas or beans in a bed, follow it with a nitrogen-loving crop such as corn, lettuce, broccoli, kale, and so on. What about cover crops? If you're going to leave a planting bed empty for the season, or once your vegetable crops are finished producing, consider planting cover crops. So what are they? These are specific plants that you plant closely together, let them grow, then chop them back, and let them decompose in the soil. I typically chop them back to the ground before they start blooming. Examples include field or winter peas, winter rye, buckwheat, vetch, and clover. They are going to add so many nutrients to your soil, which is wonderful. As you've probably noticed, we have a lot of raised beds in our garden. I'm frequently asked, where did you get all of the soil? Well, we knew we'd be covering the pathways with a landscape fabric and a few inches of bark mulch to keep the weeds down. So we didn't want to waste the lovely topsoil in the paths. While making the raised beds, we scooped the top two to three inches from the paths and added it to the beds. By the time we did that all around each bed, they were about two thirds full. Then we added in compost and organic soil amendments to fill them up. I realize that isn't an option for everybody. So I would recommend checking with your local landscape companies to see what's available. Usually they're called garden bed mix or garden soil or sometimes it also contains compost, which is great. Be sure to go to the business and look at what they're offering before you pay money for it, rather than just buying it off their website, Sight Unseen. Now we are quite lucky because for the most part, our soil is kind of a sandy loam, and that is awesome for all of the different kinds of gardening that we do. But I realize a lot of you might have either sandy soil or clay soil. Ugh. Fortunately, there is one simple answer to make both situations much better. So the problem with sandy soil is that water just runs right through it. And so it makes it difficult to keep the soil evenly moist and your plants can struggle. With clay soil, it is just such a dense structure that it tends to get kind of waterlogged and plants really struggle in it. So if you add compost to sandy soil, that slows the movement of the water through the soil and your plants will do great. If you add compost to clay soil, what happens is it breaks apart that dense structure of the soil 
and the soil will stay more lightly moist more consistently rather than being all kind of clogged full of water. So compost is the answer. And funny I should mention compost because that's the second half of this video. Now every year what we do to all of our beds is we put a layer, usually about two or three inches thick, of compost on the soil surface. And like I mentioned a few minutes ago, the nutrients filter down into the soil by themselves so we don't have to fork it in and disturb that soil. Now we make our own compost. It never seems like we make enough and I know that's a common problem with a lot of gardeners. But it's something I highly recommend because it does replenish a lot of nutrients within the soil. Now you can purchase compost in bags from different kinds of home centers and farm supply stores. If you can get organic, that would be awesome. You can make your own and I wanted to go through the steps of how you do that. We have a small kitchen waste pail under our kitchen sink that we put in things like eggshells, coffee grounds, vegetable and fruit peelings, and so on. And in the lid of the pail, there's a little carbon filter, and so that keeps any odors down. And then we bring it out to our compost bins. This is our compost setup, which we made a couple of years ago. And I know it doesn't look so pretty this time of year, but that's just because all we've been doing is adding things to the pile and leaving it at that. But what we did is we used some free pallets and then a few extra boards just to make it look nicer on the outside so that we could have a three bin setup. You don't have to have three bins. You can have a single bin. That is not a problem. There's also closed compost bins that you can purchase. There are a lot of different varieties of those and the thing is that they are very helpful if you have a problem with different types of critters, especially rodents. Composting can seem like a really complicated subject, but it isn't at all. You've probably heard the term carbon to nitrogen ratio and thought, okay, that's too complicated. It isn't. So what you're talking about is adding two times as much carbon or brown materials as green materials or nitrogen. So let me give you examples of each of those. Carbon materials are also known as brown materials. They include things like dead leaves, dead plant material, animal bedding that contains straw and sawdust, torn up cardboard or newspaper, dead branches that aren't larger than half an inch in diameter. And of course, the smaller they are, the faster they'll decompose. Also eggshells and shredded paper. Nitrogen materials are also known as green materials. Grass clippings from a lawn that has not been treated with herbicides like weed and feed. This is really important, you guys. Coffee grounds, kitchen scraps, tea bags, green plant material, chicken or rabbit droppings. Your goal for your pile is to put about two times as many brown materials as green materials. Now here's what you should not put in your pile. Meat, fish, cooking oils, or dairy products because those will attract animals, especially rodents. No manure from carnivorous animals because they can contain dangerous pathogens. No manure from horses or cattle due to the potential for herbicides that will remain in your garden for several years. No diseased plants, always dispose of them. Don't add weeds that are hard to control, and especially if they are blooming. Now when you're making your compost pile, try to alternate layers of the green and brown materials. And two other important components of composting are air or oxygen and moisture. So when you turn the pile, that incorporates more airflow into the pile. And as far as moisture goes, 
you want to occasionally add some water to the pile if it seems quite dry. The goal is to have lightly moist materials, not sopping wet and not super dry. Now, one of the things that is extremely cool, if you have a compost thermometer or a soil thermometer, and both are super easy to find at garden centers and home centers, they're inexpensive, and you will get to watch the temperature fluctuations from really high and then going down kind of into a little valley and then back up to a peak and so on. And that's telling you the amount of activity that's going on in your compost pile as microorganisms and certain types of insects are breaking down the materials. If it seems like not much is happening, go ahead and turn the pile with a spading fork or a shovel or a manure fork or something along those lines. Now there's two types of composting as far as the amount of interaction you have with your pile. There's cold composting and hot composting. So with cold composting, that means minimal interaction with your pile. You just kind of let it do its thing. And you know that works for busy people. It can take one to two years to turn into nice crumbly compost. Fast composting means turning the pile on about a weekly basis to speed up the process and it should be ready in several months. So it's really a matter of how much time you have to work with the pile. How do you know when it's done? Well, when it has a nice earthy smell and it's very crumbly and you can't recognize the materials that were in the pile, that is finished compost. Okay, so those are the basics of soil and composting that I wanted to share with you today. I hope you found it interesting and helpful. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. Happy gardening.